Ray Kurzweil is an American author, computer scientist, inventor and futurist. At present he serves as head of the Artificial Intelligence Department There's at Google. There's a phenomenon that people are not aware of, which is the exponential progression of information technology outside of these devices we carry around. For example, health and medicine is going to be transformed by biotechnology, which is applying the exponential progression of information technology to biology. The, the enabling factor for that was the Genome Project that was a perfect exponential and that's now beginning to influence clinical practice. Uh, we're starting to see profound uh, new therapies created by reprogramming the outdated software of life. Uh, and that's a completely different uh, methodology than health and medicine has used in the past. Health and medicine has basically been hit or miss. We kind of find things uh, that happen to work. We didn't have the means of really reprogramming the software of life. Uh, that is now becoming a reality and that's an exponential progression. These technologies are now a thousand times more powerful than they were when the general project was completed a decade ago or more than a decade ago. They'll be another thousand times more powerful in ten years. It's going to profoundly transform health and medicine. But people use the linear models of the past that yes we've been making slow linear progress because of the methodology we use was hit or miss. It's completely changing now. Uh, we, exponentials look like nothing is happening. It's very slow uh, and then when you reach the knee of the curve they, they kind of take off. We're just approaching that now in health and medicine. So looking at the sort of linear progression of say life expectancy uh, over the last century is not a good uh, indicator of what's going to happen because we have this exponential progression that's about to descend on this and it's going to be a tsunami of innovations in, in health and medicine. And I call that the second bridge. The third bridge is uh, nanotechnology where we'll go beyond the limitations of biology. The, the quintessential application there is medical nanorobots that will extend our immune system. Our immune system evolved 50,000 years ago when conditions were very different. It was not in the interest of the human species for us to live very long. Life expectancy was 19,000 years ago. So our, our T cells don't go after things that get us later on in life, like cancer and things. Oh, that's me and doesn't treat it as a pathogen. Uh, it doesn't work on retroviruses, it doesn't work on prions. We can create a medical nanorobot that goes against all pathogens also fixes problems with organs. Lots of diseases are metabolic diseases with a malfunction of our organs. I and mean, what do all these organs do anyway? They basically put things in the bloodstream and they take things out. The lungs put in oxygen, take out carbon dioxide. The kidneys take out toxins. The entire digestive tract puts in nutrients. All these different hormonal organs like the pancreas put in, put out uh, hormones like insulin. Lots of diseases have to do with malfunctions in those processes. Another function of these medical nanorobots can be to monitor the bloodstream for optimal levels of all these substances and puts them in, takes them out, augment, even replace the function of all the organs. There's actually a very detailed scenario and designs for how to overcome every disease and aging process once we have the enabling factor of these medical nanorobots. And we know exactly how to create the medical nanorobots if we have the enabling factor of being able to do atomically precise manufacturing. That's coming. We'll have that by, well, I've been saying the, the early 2030s, that's increasingly looking conservative. We may have it in the 2020s. Uh, but that's the third bridge. Uh, the second bridge is basically just reprogramming our biology by turning genes on, turning them off. Uh, reprogramming stem cells to, for example, grow new organs. That's actually being done now successfully in animals. I'm involved with a company where we're growing lungs, kidneys, and hearts and installing them in animals. That's coming to a human near you. So there's going to be very tr profound transformations. That's just medicine. 3D printing is going to print out all the physical things we need. We'll be able to create food very inexpensively, very high quality without chemicals using AI-controlled vertical agriculture. And there's revolutions coming in every 
industry ultimately will be able to provide the physical needs of human life for everyone at very low cost. Liz Parrish is the founder and CEO of BioV The Sciences USA Incorporated. Liz is known as the woman who wants to genetically engineer you. She is a humanitarian, entrepreneur and innovator and a leading voice for genetic cures. Hi, my name's Liz Parrish and I'm at the Now Gallery today. I'm sorry I can't be with you because these are important conversations and important topics that we're talking about, but I'm really happy to be here at all. Uh, so today we're going to talk about radical life extension or life extension in general and what does that mean to the world? What are the social implications of extending lifespan? And more importantly, what we're working on at my company BioViva, extending health span because we don't want you to just live longer we want you to live well longer. We want you to live healthy, youthful, and robust. So in order to really understand the subject, we kind of need to take a walk back into the past. What has been done? What is different about your life today than how people just lived a couple hundred years ago? So in the 18th century, Thomas Hobbes wrote that life was nasty, brutish, and short. And that was actually true. The average lifespan of a person in the 1700s was only about 35 years of age. Uh, so how things changed now? Uh, we've already had what would be considered radical life extension. And how did it happen? It happened because of science. Uh, so with the advent of antibiotics and immunizations, we were able to triple lifespan. Believe it or not, you're already living a radical life extension. But the problem is, is that now we're not living these short lives that end really quickly. We're living longer lives and we're suffering frailty and disability. Uh, we're spending more time in these sort of disease states. Uh, if you think about it, Alzheimer's is eight to 10 years of your life. Heart disease can, can be half of it, just slowly, incrementally making you sicker over time. And cancer, uh, one of the most feared diagnoses on the planet, uh, kills about a third of the population. So what can we do about this? Well, we have to use science uh, to move forward. Uh, we, we do the nat next, next natural step, and that is creating therapeutics uh, that actually do what uh, antibiotics and immunizations did, a, did for us uh, the first time. Uh, we create now therapies that are going to treat biological aging. Uh, we're going to sort of snuff out and stop biological aging in its tracks and help people live longer, healthier lives. So I'm going to tell you uh, kind of how that would happen and why we would do that. So let's talk about why we would do that. For one thing, it's a great thing for science to do. We want to get rid of suffering on the planet. We want to create meaningful lives for people. But there are also other things that are pressing on us today that were never pressing on us before. There's something called the silver tsunami. <laughs> Okay, so think about a big wave of, of silver, gray-haired people that are about to uh, essentially roll right over the economy. So in 2020, we'll have more people on the planet over 65 than under the age of five. So what does that mean? What are the implications for that? So that means that the five-year-olds go on to be 15 and 20. They become the workforce, whereas the 65-year-olds, a growing population, uh, becomes you know, 70 and 75, uh, they become disabled, they become uh, more sick. Uh, it takes more of the economy to care for their illnesses. But what if we could keep those people healthy? What if we could actually uh, create robust people out of the persons who are alive now? What if people could work longer? Uh, what if they could enjoy their life uh, for an extended period of time? Uh, this is a massive benefit of, of the sciences that we're doing. So when we talk about biological aging being a disease, let's remember we're not talking about chronological aging. We want you to get older by years. We want you to get as old as, as you wish to be. We want to create healthy bodies uh, that don't get sick. But um, that, that, that uh, biological aging is actually something that's happening at the cellular level. That's what we're going after. So we're going after biological aging, not chronological aging. You want, want to get older, we want you to get older, but we do not want you to biologically age. And what is biological 
physical aging. Well, that's probably what you're wondering. What is driving these diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's and heart disease and, and, a, and a few other things like frailty that people uh, do die of? You know, they fall down and break their hip. Well, it's cells getting old. And cells getting old do all sorts of things. Uh, they, start, they stop signaling really well. Their proteins don't signal to other cells as well. They don't receive things. We, we uh, have attrition of our stem cells. Uh, we have less stem cells in our body, so we have less ability to uh, recover from injury. Uh, we have attrition of our telomeres. Uh, this is something that our company looks at uh, specifically. Our telomeres get shorter as our cells divide. Uh, so there are a whole slew of these markers like glycation and other things that I won't get into right now, but certainly you can look them up. You can come see them on our website or, or, or other universities who are working on similar problems. Uh, but these are the sort of hallmarks of aging that we're going after. And this, these are the reasons that we couldn't cure disease in the past. So we were like throwing billions of dollars, you've got a kind of picture, billions of dollars at cancer and billions of dollars at, at uh, dementia. And now trillions of dollars uh, are the projection for the next several years. Uh, we cannot solve these problems because we weren't solving the root cause of the problem. Uh, our company is not the only one. Some of the biggest players in the world are now getting involved in this. So it's really, you know, the science is there. It's not science fiction. It's, it's a fact. Uh, we are doing this in animal models. We have several animal models that we've actually extended life uh, as far as 11 times. And this is healthy life. Again, that's what we're, that's what we're uh, sort of uh, basing this premise on. We want you to be healthy longer. So let's talk about some of the benefits of longevity. What are the benefits of longevity? So we already talked about cost savings. It'll cost us a lot of money because we won't be paying for these really expensive diseases. Suffering savings, uh, people will be suffering less. But what about education? What if you had a longer life to actually spend uh, doing the things that you like to and getting the education when you're ready? And maybe even having a couple different parts of your life where you do vastly different things. Uh, you never have to get bored. Equality. Uh, certainly health is a big issue. If we could bring good health to the world and everyone was on equal standing uh, from birth all the way through their life with a strong, healthy, robust body, we, we can actually work towards these bigger causes of equality. Uh, as far as the environment, this gives us more time to think about our actions. If you live long enough to see uh, the response to the thing that you dump into the river, uh, for instance, if you start to see uh, three-eyed fish because you continued to pollute a certain area of the world, well then you're certainly going to see the impact and you're going to have a greater response to ensuring that that doesn't happen. So we're hoping that through longevity and we will all take incentive in taking care of the earth better and taking care of each other better. So a lot of people ask me how did I get into this? Why why would I do this? And, and really it is passion. Uh, my son got sick and I was determined to find a cure for him and for other kids. Um, I just so happened to get into the life extension round because it turns out that a lot of what's driving childhood disease is actually driving the diseases in adults, as a matter of fact, more so. And so this was the most likely place to solve the problem for both the elder population and the younger population. And it gives us a breadth of knowledge to solve very difficult diseases uh, that we don't understand today. This is the place to start. And if we just take an emphasis really quick on passion, uh, I would really like to encourage kids and adults, I don't want you to be limited by age. Uh, age is not a defining factor of when you find your passion. For me, it wasn't until my 40s. Uh, for some people, they find it when they're a teenager. But the most important thing is that you run with that passion, that that is what drives you. You need your education. You need your education for the background knowledge on what you will do with your life. So garner as much knowledge as you can in your life, but always search for your passion because that's how you're ultimately going to change the world and if you're here watching this I know that you're one of the people who's going to do that it's not special people that change the world it's people who get ignited uh, by a passion by something that they can't sleep at night uh, without solving and don't think that any problem is too big you know I was I always say that I'm just somebody's mother but in fact my company is working on a cure for the the grandest disease on, on the
the planet, biological aging, and that cure will have implications to children all over the world as well. And we have the, um, the strong strong need to get these technologies all around the world. We can't just solve the problem. These technologies will belong to everyone. We will have a mandate once we do and achieve uh, this science. So again, I just want to inspire you. I want you to know that a passion and a grand future does not just lie in me. I'm an ordinary person. It lies in every one of you. So find the spark, uh, let it take off, and find your future through your passion. Peter Diamandis is a Greek-American engineer, physician, and entrepreneur best known for being the founder and chairman of the X Prize Foundation, the co-founder and executive chairman of Singularity University. Our next amazing area of exponential growth is health medicine. Uh, the ability, if we would, to recombine a whole slew of technologies to affect how we are live our lives in a healthy manner. So let's look at data, let's look at stem cells, let's look at genetics, look at brain-computer interface and this explosion that's been happening over just the last six months. So the first one is a program run out of Microsoft by the team at Bing for predicting cancer, particular pancreatic cancer, in efficiencies far better than ever before. So universities at the Health and Wellness Division at Microsoft have been able to mine search queries from 6.4 million Bing users for searches of symptoms and found they could predict diagnoses weeks in advance. And by identifying searches that could suggest other risk factors like alcoholism and obesity, the team successfully predicted pancreatic cancer diagnosis up to five months in advance. And if you're thinking about pancreatic cancer, it is aggressive. Five months can mean the difference between life and death. Now, I love this. This is out of UCLA. A team has developed a brand new microscope combined with AI to find cancer cells much faster. When I say much faster, we're talking about being able to analyze 36 million images per second and spot cancer cells with 95% accuracy. There's no excuse anymore for not finding cancer in its earliest days. If you've been following the health news, the big craze is immunotherapy. Out of the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center, they pioneered a breakthrough living immunotherapy treatment that engineers the patient's own immune system to be able to target specific molecules on your cancer cell. So you can imagine sequencing your body, sequencing the cancer, identifying special, certain, unique molecules for that cancer, and then getting your immune system to attack that so that you are fighting back your own cancer. I think this is amazing. I was in medical school when HIV AIDS came onto the scene and was this unknown death sentence that people had. And look at how far we've come. Temple University researchers have successfully edited the HIV virus out of human immune cell DNA. It's all due, of course, to that amazing technology of CRISPR-Cas9 that we've all been hearing so much about. They've eliminated the HIV-1 DNA from a T-cell genome and allowed that individual to actually regain their normal human health. So another amazing field is the ability to use stem cells to repair the body. Our stem cells, as we grow older, undergo these epigenetic changes, deletions, mutations, and they become less capable of repairing. Also, our body supply of stem cells plummets over the course of our first 50, 60 years. Out of Stanford University School of Medicine, investigators have just completed a small clinical trial in which they safely restored motor function in chronic stroke patients by injecting specially prepared human adult stem cells into that patient's brain. Imagine being told you'll never walk again or never move your arms again, having one injection and then be able to regain that capability. It really is an amazing period to be alive, more than ever before. We're seeing the same impact of stem cells on returning vision to a person who's lost their vision. In addition to stem cells, another magical biological technology coming online right now is called gene therapy. This was early developed 1980s, had a lot of hype, didn't actually work, but for the first time ever, gene therapy has cured a disease. You know the disease known as bubble boy, where you have no immunoprotective capability. So a company out of Europe is poised to become the first commercial gene therapy uh, provider 
to outright cure a deadly disease. And this particular cure has been tested on 18 children over the last 15 years. GlaxoSmithKline that owns this patent is about to seek US deployment and FDA approval. Let's go into the area of brain-computer interface. So DARPA's new program is called the Targeted Neuroplasticity Training Program, and it's hoping to have subjects learn super fast, learning languages, learning skills faster than ever before. Along that line, researchers at HRL Labs have been using transcranial direct current stimulation to take recorded brain patterns from an expert pilot and transmit them to a novice pilot across the brain cranial divide. And this method has yielded a 33% increase in skill consistency compared to the control group. So imagine being able to learn skills faster and better than ever before. One of the important parts of that is trying to understand and decode how our brain codes visual, auditory, and sensory input and then stores it in the hippocampus. So for the first time ever, University of Washington scientists have decoded brain signals in real time. The technique takes us one step closer to brain mapping and it's helping researchers pinpoint which brain locations are sensitive to certain information types. This is a chance to understand how the brain stores images and thoughts and equations. So this is just one quick look at the field of health. Genomics, CRISPR-Cas9, stem cells, brain-computer interface, we're exploding last six months. Get ready for an amazing world ahead. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, share and leave your comments below. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more releases from PsyQ.